Isaiah 54, as you do so, again, just to express appreciation to the elders for allowing us to come every year and have fellowship with you and uh, enjoy the word and the love and the family of this church. Uh, I count it a great privilege. And uh, as I've said many times, it's the highlight of the year for both uh, Sissy and me. And I trust that tonight's sermon will be a great encouragement to you as you move forward. We're going to read the entire chapter of Isaiah 54. I turned it on. You turned it on. Ah, I did. Ha <laughs> ha. Thank you. <laughs> Such a good boy am I. Isaiah 54. Shout for joy, O barren one, you who have borne no child. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtain, curtains of your dwellings. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left. And your descendants, your seed, will possess the nations and will resettle the desolate cities. <clears throat> Fear not, for you will not be put to shame. And do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. But you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In an outburst of anger I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting loving kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is like the days of Noah to me, when I swore that the waters of Noah would not flood the earth again. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you, nor will I rebuke you. For the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you, and my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antinomy, and your foundations I will lay in sapphires. Moreover, I will make your battlements of rubies and your gates of crystal and your entire wall of precious stones. All your sons will be taught of the Lord, and the well-being of your sons will be great. In righteousness you will be established. You will be far from oppression, for you will not fear, and from terror, for it will not come near you. If anyone fiercely assails you, it will not be from me. Whoever assails you will fall because of you. Behold, I myself have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and brings out a weapon for its work. And I've created the destroyer to ruin no weapon that is formed against you will prosper, and every tongue that accuses you in judgment you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. Again, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God does endure forever. Let us pray. Lord, it is with keen anticipation that we now turn our hearts and minds unto you as we come to the high point of our worship where the Lord God himself, the triune God, speaks to us in the ordinance that you have appointed. And so we say with the servant of old, speak, Lord, for your servants listen. Speak to us now. Have mercy on us for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We have um, looked fairly intently at this last servant song about the Lord Jesus Christ, beginning in Isaiah 52, 13, and concluding here in chapter 53. And 
I think many of us have, have been blessed as God has met with us. He's taught us things. Uh, trust He's stirred our hearts, sanctified us. But there's a question for you as a congregation. What now? What now? We do this conference every year. What does it mean now in the life of Covenant Presbyterian Church in New Bern, North Carolina? Well, I want to answer that question tonight from the first five verses of Isaiah chapter 54. Perhaps you've noticed, particularly after I've read tonight, that the servant song is in the middle of two chapters that deal with what? The church. The church. That's not an accident, is it? We saw that in chapter 52 that God has promised the deliverance of the church, the restoration, uh, his blessing on the church, and then he moves right into, well, what are we talking about? The agent of the blessing on the church. You must not separate uh, the work and glory, the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ and his inheritance from his church. And now we come in chapter 54, and we see exactly what God has promised or is promising to do in and through his church through the exalted servant to whom he has given the nations, through whom he will sprinkle uh, the kings and nations with regeneration, through whom he has given this great covenant seed. And so we come tonight to look at the consequence, so to speak, of the servant's reign in the church. And because of the servant's exaltation, the church is to pray God, uh, praise God and confidently to prepare for growth. Because of the servant's exaltation, the church is to praise God and prepare confidently for growth. So we'll consider those two things. The church is to praise God for her growth, but the church is to prepare confidently for yet more extensive growth. The first point is in verse 1. Shout for joy, O barren one, you who have borne no child. Break forth into joyful shouting and cry aloud, you who have not travailed. For the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. You see that we have a commandment here. Immediately upon the uh, exaltation of the servant in verse 12, and remember this all just flows as one great narrative, we have a threefold commandment to, um, to praise God. Now, look to whom this commandment is addressed, for that's very important. It is one who is described as a barren woman, a barren wife. Notice the multiplication. She's barren. Uh, she's not born a child. Um, she is a desolate one. And with these figures, in the first place, the prophet is speaking about the desolate church that is being carried away in a few uh, hundred decades uh, into captivity. And is very much in this status of, of, a, of, a, of a barren, a desolate wife who has no children and been bereaved of her children. And so uh, the old covenant church is to be scattered. And it is to her uh, that God is first speaking. But never forget that when we read of the church in the old covenant, it's always a type of the church in the new covenant, clearly established in scripture in many places. God uses, must use, for this is how you communicate to people, Old Covenant terms to people of those days to communicate New Covenant reality. Consider, for example, Amos's prophecy in chapter 9. In that day I will raise up the fallen booth of David and wall up its breaches. I will also raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Now, how was that ultimately fulfilled? Well, James quotes that passage in Acts 15, verses 14 and 15, to explain that Gentiles are going to be incorporated into the church. Uh, that the booth of David, uh, the, the, the breached wall of Jerusalem, are in fact pictures of the church of God 
through which he is going now to gather the Gentiles unto himself. Paul makes this clear in Galatians 4, 26 and 27, where he refers to Isaiah 54, 1. And he refers to the church. Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than the one who has a husband. And so Christ through the prophet is speaking to the new covenant church. That means Christ through the prophet is speaking to us as part of this congregation. Swansboro congregation, any other congregations represented here uh, tonight, a part of the new covenant church, even though they were not in the same denomination, we're, one part, we're part of the universal visible church of the triune God. And if the church is faithful, has the marks of the church, then she may consider this spoken to her even today. But particularly pointedly, I want you to consider that God is speaking to you tonight because of uh, the suffering servant who now is exalted. He is telling you to do something, and that is to rejoice exuberantly. Just as the barrenness is described with three terms, so is this commandment. Shout for joy, O barren one, you who have borne no child. Break forth into joyful shouting. Cry aloud. Not dissimilar from what we uh, heard in, in Psalm 98. Or consider Psalm uh, verses 4 and 6. Not what we heard, what I actually intended to read. Shout joyfully, because it, it paraphrases this. It really seems to come from it. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth and sing for joy. Sing praises with lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn. Shout joyfully before the King, the Lord. This threefold commandment sets before us the responsibility of exuberant praise and worship to God. The exuberance of, of a football fan at a, a, a title football game. The exuberance of, of a farmer when he sees the, the crop breaking through the soil. The exuberance of a young couple with their firstborn child. This is the, the kind of joy that he's saying that is to grip Grip the church. And then he tells us why. He gives the grounds. All in this one verse. Notice we've been talking about uh, Isaiah's uh, grammar. In the middle of the verse, we got a four. All right, here's the grounds. Four. Why? Because, four, the sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman. Playing again on this figure of barren and desolate, what he's saying here, if, if, if the sons of the desert are more numerous than the sons of the maybe he's saying it's going to be a supernatural work. There's not, not going to be anything ordinary about this. But the exalted servant, by the power of his spirit, is supernaturally going to reproduce his church. Remember, we saw that he has been given the seed. That's part of, of the reward. He will see his seed. He'll prolong his days. The good pleasure of Jehovah will prosper in his hand. And now we're being told that this is going to happen by a great supernatural work. Nothing ordinary about it. Now we can take it literally. Uh, think about the desolate church that was taken into captivity, dispersed. Uh, throughout the Babylonian Empire, along with the northern kingdom, dispersed throughout the, what was once the Assyrian Empire. And they finally, God brings them back to the land with servants and slaves. They numbered about 50,000. That was it. Out of that great host of people that had been uh, repelled from the land by the justice of God, about 50,000 come back. But writers estimate on the basis of sacrifices and whatever that in the first century in Jerusalem there were two to three million people. That God kept the promise for his church. Just as he multiplied the church in Egypt in a very intense brief period of time, he multiplied his church in order to prepare his church for 
the coming servant of Jehovah. But then we make the parallel and we think about the origin of the New Testament church. Out of that one, two, three million people, we don't know how many expected the Messiah, but there were a handful, Elizabeth and Zechariah, Joseph and Mary, Simeon, Anna, uh, others that were waiting by God's clear message. Um, that first ragtag band of, of apostles. Um, maybe in Galilee there were a, a few hundred uh, from that itinerant ministry. Surely there were those women that followed him and, and served him. In Jerusalem there were maybe 120 uh, that were meeting together for prayer after the ascension of the Savior. It was a desolate one. They were, they were barren. And yet, in a matter of uh, one generation, it would be said by their opponents they turned the world upside down. Paul could say uh, toward the end of his life that the gospel had been proclaimed throughout the Roman Empire. And the church was vibrant and growing, uh, even in Jerusalem. So we go from that handful to what? 40 days, 50 days later, 3,000 brought into the church. Another 2,000 later. And then the gospel spreads out to the ends of the earth. You see, the church had grounds to praise God in this exuberant manner because he, in order to honor the Son, remember we go back to this covenant, we're talking about an eternal covenant that the Father is going to honor the Son. He's giving the Son the nations as his inheritance. God doesn't break covenant, does he? He's given him this great seed. He's going to, out of the anguish of his soul, look on the many who are being justified. He's given an inheritance among the great, and he's despoiling his enemies. And God did that. But you understand that God has done that for you here. 25 years ago, approximately, this mission work began. And through these 25 years, God has converted people, sent people out throughout the world to be parts in other churches, have gathered many covenant children unto himself and seen them nurture and growing up to serve God uh, faithfully. Does that fill you with exuberant praise? When you get weary, oh, how we should thank God. There was not a Reformed Presbyterian witness to speak of in New Bern, North Carolina. And yet here we are tonight. And though there's been ups and downs, we see that there has been uh, overall a pattern of growth, spiritual growth, but numerical growth as well. But then think what's happened in these 25 years. Now, most, most of you are just going to talk about your Presbytery, but since my dear brother is here, well, 25 years ago, there was not a Calvinistic Baptist church in Swansboro. Today, I understand they've got over 120 people in attendance, people being converted, people being built up in the faith. But think about your own presbytery. I hope you've done this. When you started, and I'll, get, I'll miss some of them, but there was no church in Greensboro. There was only one church in Raleigh. Uh, there was uh, only one church in Charlotte. There was no church in Royston. There was no church in Wilmington. There was no mission work in Bluffton. There was no church in Virginia Beach and no mission work in Yorktown. That should amaze you. And I probably left out something. That should amaze you. Because that is what God told us he's going to do. And we, in our worship and in our corporate prayer meeting and our private prayer, should be praising God that he's honoring this covenant commitment and he's gathering his church and he's supernaturally, by sovereign grace, bringing people into it. I hope it does. But that's just the beginning. Not only does the Spirit tell us that we are to praise God for the growth of the church, 
but we are to prepare confidently for greater growth. And these, the next four verses, we have the commandment in verse 2. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Spare not. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your pegs. And here is clearly language that is talking to the church to prepare for growth. So she's to praise God for what he has done. But now he's saying, because of the promise to the servant of Jehovah, get ready for much more. In a sense, he uses the figures of the wilderness wanderings, uh, the 40 years where the church lived in tents and multiplied and grew. After they were destroyed, they came back up. I think particularly when he talks about enlarging the place of your tent, he is referring to uh, that wonderful promise in Genesis 9, 27. After we read of Shem um, being the special chosen of God, he says, May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem. So here we see that uh, God is enlarging the tents of Israel the Old Covenant Church, now in the New Covenant, by bringing the Gentiles in. See, that's the, the promise that was first given here with respect to uh, the New Covenant Church. So, uh, spread out to the right and left. Go every direction. Plan for this growth. Uh, stretch the curtains of your dwellings. You've got to make more room. You've got to strengthen those tent pegs. And lengthen your cords so that the church will be strong and sturdy. And notice how he just slips into there. Um, spare not. Spare not. We tend to spare ourselves. <laughs> spare not. If you're serious about this matter, this promise of the growth of the church, quit pampering yourself. For there is work to be done. And that work is to be done by all of us who are part of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he tells us that we are to go forward now with this gospel commission. And notice then his promise in verse 3. For, there again is our word, you will spread abroad to the right and to the left, your descendants will possess nations and will resettle desolate cities. I describe this as population explosion, world conquest, and urban renewal. That's what we have here. We got a population explosion now. Um, yeah, you must expand your church, your facilities. Why? Because you're going to spread to the right and to the left. The idea of just a, a broad, comprehensive, universal spreading. Uh, these three grounds that we have here uh, were first said in Isaiah 49 and in chapter 49:19. for your waste, no, excuse me, uh, 49, 20 and 21, the children whom you were bereaved will yet say in your ears, this place is too cramped for me. Make room for me that I may live here. And you will say in your heart, who's begotten these for me? Since I've been bereaved of my children, and I'm barren in exile and a wanderer. Who's reared these? Behold, I was left alone. From where did these come? And that series of rhetorical questions is, there's going to be this supernatural population explosion. A great gathering of elect unto uh, the Lord God. That's going to lead to the world conquest that Jehovah promised with respect to his son in 52.15. Uh, I'll sprinkle many nations. He'll sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. Or he'll have a portion with the great and divide booty with the strong. And so well, we're told here that... Um, uh, his seed will possess the nations. This great seed that was part of the covenant uh, uh, sanction. Uh, in verse 10, he will see his seed. Uh, this seed now, we're told, is going to um, conquer the world. Chapter 49, 22 and 23. Thus says uh, the Lord God, our Adonai Jehovah there, the great Adonai Jews when God 
focuses on the fact that he is the God of the peoples. Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations. I set up my standard to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their bosom and your daughters will be carried on their shoulders. Kings will be your guardians and their princes your nurses. They'll bow down to you with their faces to the earth. Lick the dust of your feet and you will know that I am the Lord. Isaiah makes a very, I mean, Jeremiah, a very similar promise. He says that they'll be bringing, uh, bringing the nations like uh, uh, special offerings uh, to God. And they'll do it in, um, in wagons and on camels and donkeys and, and every manner of transportation. And besides the fact, nothing can hinder this worldwide expansion, this worldwide conquest of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the urban renewal. I'll resettle desolate cities. Now again, physically, uh, we know that uh, Judah was desolate, Israel was desolate, and God did settle those cities, and they began to grow and prosper, as did the mother city of Jerusalem. But this also is the promise then to uh, the gospel to come and take over cities. So in Isaiah 49, 19, your waste and desolate places, and you're destroyed, Surely now you'll be too cramped for the inhabitants, for those who swallowed you will be far away. And you've experienced this, haven't you? How many homes have been saved by the gospel? As lives are put back together. And we know historically that neighborhoods and cities and countries have uh, had this great spiritual urban renewal. We're not about social justice, and we're not about redeeming the world. We're about the gospel. But what happens when God saves people? Their lives change. Their families change. Their workplace changes. Their neighborhood changes. Their city changes. Because Christ told us to evangelize the nations, make disciples of the nations. And what do we see in chapter 52? He's going to sprinkle many nations and bring them unto the Lord. Well, this is the basis now of this commandment to prepare for greater growth. But we sit here, uh, 50 so people, we look around and, and it seems that oftentimes the, the, the more faithful congregations in these particular days are um, not growing greatly. And we recognize in comparison to many, we have few resources. Uh, is this perhaps whistling in the dark? Are we walking through the cemetery uh, boldly, uh, whistling, trying to keep the haints away? No, uh, God goes on here then to give us uh, the grounds. In the first place, he tells us that, or he gives us the confidence. The first place he tells us that we're not to be ashamed in verse 4. Fear not, for you will not be put to shame. And do not feel humiliated, for you will not be disregarded. But you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. And uh, you reproach widowhood, you will remember no more. Uh, we do get ashamed of the gospel. We do get ashamed of our very narrow convictions when we are uh, talking to other people. And they're going to think, I'm just actually a, a kook. Uh, some country bumpkin. Um, we can be ashamed of our facilities, ashamed of our few numbers, uh, ashamed because we recognize our uh, no confidence because of, of the enormity of the task that is involved in this. But you see, again, we have this multiple commandment. Fear not and do not feel humiliated. Why? Because God will not allow you to be put to shame. God will not allow you to be disgraced. In fact, he will enable you to forget the shame of small things and the reproach of widowhood you remember no more. God puts courage into our hearts. He puts steel into our backbones. He says, quit looking back. Quit worrying about your fewness or your littleness or the lack of respect that you have from the world. We don't expect to have respect from the world. Quit worrying about it. Press ahead with this promise 
that God will take away your shame. And then we get the twofold ground for that in verse 5. For, notice again, building this argument, your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts. So, <laughs> the husband of the bride of the church is the exalted servant of Jehovah. He is our groom, and we are his bride. He has made us, is making us spiritually, even as in Psalm 100, verse 3, know uh, the Lord himself is God. It's he who made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. He's the Lord of hosts. That's what we see here. That this Christ, who is our husband, is the one who's making us. And notice he's called now the Lord of Host, Jehovah of Host, and by that title, the Holy Spirit is telling us that Christ, as the exalted servant, possesses all resources. Again, we go back to the servant song. He has received a portion among the great, and he has despoiled uh, the kingdom of his enemy. He will divide the booty with the strong. He has everything. He lacks nothing. And this is his reward. His covenant reward. And he is certain to, in a sense, put in his chips and collect that which the Father guaranteed to him in covenant from all eternity. That the nations belong to him and the uttermost ends of the earth. So our husband is our maker. And he has all things. And then the second encouragement is your Redeemer. As we've seen that He is our Redeemer. He's the Holy One of Israel. He is the second person of the Godhead. Yes, the God-man, but He is God. He is the Holy One, the one that Isaiah saw uh, a few years before this, uh, lifted up in the temple and, and cried out, the angels, the cherubim, holy, holy, holy. And John tells us he saw God the Son. Our Savior, the servant of Jehovah, is the Holy One of Israel. But notice what's added. Who is called the God of all the earth. He's no longer just the Holy One of Israel, of the Old Covenant. Now the Holy One of Israel is the Holy One of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The nations belong to Him. He's the God of the earth. And no one can stay His hand or stop him. Do you see now why I say not only are we to praise him for what he has done and is doing, but we need to get a mindset to be preparing confidently for what he says he will do. Because of the exalted servant, we are to praise God to prepare confidently for great church growth. I don't know God's timetable. He sovereignly works in different countries at different times. Um, but he is at work. Uh, but we need, to, we need to labor with confidence. Um, many of us in small reformed churches get the Eeyore attitude. Oh, oh am I. And ain't, ain't nothing good really going to happen, you know. Personal trickle in here and somebody will come there and once in a while we'll get a family that moves into town. But converting our neighbors? Uh, turning this town upside down? Us? We? This little church? You, you must not think that way. Now, I, I, I'm not promising you what God will do, but I know that there are many elect in this town and in other towns where you live. And I appreciate Jeremy praying for Antioch. The whole reason I would take the last years of my life and take a dead church, look at this urban renewal, uh, is the, this type of scripture. There is a population explosion around that little building. There are going to be thousands of unconverted people and people that do not know the Reformed gospel. Uh, and so it's with confidence. If God's willing then he's going to build a church. 
He's going to save people. He's going to mentor people. He's going to bring them to, uh, to the Reformed faith. And I believe that, you see. Now, all I'm called to do is be faithful. I cannot produce results, and nor can you. But you are called to be faithful. So what does that calling look like for Covenant Presbyterian Church in New Bern? Well, the first place, that calling means that each of you needs to be using the means of grace so that you're daily dying to sin and growing in conformity to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, that means you must be sure that you're in Christ and resting in Him alone for your salvation. The next thing it means is you then must be faithfully committed to the corporate life of this church. Primarily, it's morning and evening worship, but also it's prayer meeting. I've said this here before. I say it everywhere I go. One of the primary reasons Reformed churches are not growing today and are not seeing conversions is we don't have a prayer meeting. I'm not talking about a Bible study. You know, you've got a good prayer meeting. But you've got to be committed to the prayer meeting and plead with God then to pour out the Spirit and to keep these kind of promises. One of the things that we do in our prayer meeting in Antioch is we have a regular prayer guide that is made public and it keeps us, we don't talk very long about prayer requests. We actually pretty much pray nonstop for 45 minutes. But we also have what I call the secret list. And that secret list is a list of unconverted people for whom we are praying by name. A family members, some out of town, people with whom we're making contact in town, other relationships that people have, and they're being prayed for in the prayer meeting and in our private praying. That God, because it's God alone that does this, God alone makes a barren, desolate woman have children. It's God alone that will convert these people. So be committed to that. And then give yourself, uh, under the guidance of the elders, with the gifts, as I said this morning, God's given each one of you, to the work of the church and outreach. With evangelism and hospitality and uh, whatever particular uh, avenues that uh, uh, God sets before this church. And let that be your priority. You, you'll have other priorities. But you remember, I trust you remember, that the church is God's great agent now. That's what we've been seeing here. And I was reminded today of, of I often come back to chapter 25, the Confession, paragraph 3. Under this Catholic visible church, Christ hath given the ministry, oracles, and ordinances, in other words, all the resources for the gathering and perfecting of the saints in this life to the end of the world. And doth by his own presence and spirit, according to his promise, make them effectual thereunto. It is here in the local church, in the visible church, that God has promised, that God has appointed that he would gather his elect, that God has promised that he would gather his elect, that God has promised that he would build them up, and that our resources then will do other things. We'll be involved by gifts and talents in <coughs> crisis pregnancy center or <coughs> prison ministry or <coughs> other types of, 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 of activity. But let your energies be focused on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's to the church that this promise is given. And may God bless us. May we see multiple conversions. And they will really have reason to shout. Uh, multiple families saved and lives put back together. Because at the end of the day, it's all about the exaltation of the servant of Jehovah. Your Savior. Your Lord. Your Redeemer. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that uh, the Spirit brings this to uh, a conclusion for us as we think in terms of the exalted servant now, in terms of the life of this congregation. Our lives, the other congregations represented here, our attempts to serve you in other areas as well, Lord, and that you will uh, uh, encourage us and <coughs> Make us much more thoughtful about answers to prayer and about the things you are doing. Yes, even here in, in uh, North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia, Virginia. Of course, 
and at the ends of the earth, Lord. And we know there's some places where the gospel today is spreading with great power. There's other places where you've allowed roadblocks temporarily to be thrown up. But we pray that we will labor confidently for, for the growth of the church, for the gathering perfecting of the elect. Encourage us unto this end, for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Let us now uh, conclude this service with the church's one foundation, selection 347 in the Trinity hymnal. Then we'll have the benediction. The doxology is 731. In the